Thank you all for coming this evening for this launch event of the wonderful new anthology, Lucifer Over London. Um, this event is being held as part of Swirl of Words, Swirl of Worlds, a partnership project between Peer and Shoreditch Library that is continuing until 14th of August. The project celebrates the diversity and multilingualism of Hackney and explores the relationship between language and cultural identity through the lens of poetry, language and contemporary art. There are three main strands to the programme. Um, a poetry publication consisting of 116 poems from 94 languages, each one representing a language spoken in Hackney. The poems in the book were gathered by poet, translator and language activist Stephen Watts and 3,000 copies are being given away for free to Hackney Library members across the borough. There is also a hardback copy, which is this one, available to buy today um, at, by the bar for £25, and all profits go towards supporting the Swirl of Words um, project. You can, the free version is also available by just signing up to be a member of Hackney Libraries, or if you already are, just pop into your local library and pick up a copy. Um, there's also a multimedia brief exhibition at both Peer and Shoreditch Library. It's flowing themes of the project. Um, both venues open tonight until 8pm. And there's a 10-week programme of in-person and online events taking place at Peer and Shoreditch Library and locations across Hoxton. All of these events are being filmed and are available on our YouTube channel, so if you've missed anything that's already gone, you can go to our website, it's all there, and this, this event will also be made available online. I will now hand over to Kit from Influx Press, who will introduce Lisa Fover London and the authors speaking tonight. Thank you very much. Um, hi, thank you for coming. Thank you to Pierre um, for hosting us. Um, this is the book. Um, technically, came out last year. Um, and uh, what happened last year was that uh, some sort of virus occurred, um, and it meant that bookshops closed and books couldn't be sold in places. So we, we're going to have it in May. We're going to do a big launch event in foils with all the authors, and then that all went away. And then we delayed it to November, thinking everything would be, everything would be fine in November, and then nothing was fine in November. Uh, and then, so we did a virtual launch, which is kind of, you know, that was fine, but it's still virtual. Uh, and then Vanny, um, who uh, is the big person behind this project, um, suggested we do something here. So I'm really excited that we've been able to get a live event together and also to meet some of the authors who I've just known via email for like the last 18 months. So that's been really, really nice. Um, so this was first published in Italy uh, in Italian um, and Vanny was behind the project. Um, and I think it's appropriate that it was done in Italy first because, well, England seemed to come second to Italy in a lot of things at the moment. Uh, including this book. Uh, I'm really pleased to be publishing um, these authors who, in my head, are very prestigious. And um, when you put them all in one book, uh, it makes a really wonderful volume. So we've got Sala Adonia, Chloe Ridges, Vanny Benconi, Viola de Grado, Jean Luc Guo, Susanna Moirena Marquez, Joanna Walsh, Sinevi Zinnick, and photographs from Wolfgang Lerner. Um, I think the book looks at London uh, in ways I haven't seen London be looked at before. The concept behind it, which I'm sure Vanny can expand on a bit, is of people who arrive as adults uh, to London and are writing about their experiences or their understanding of London and of British Britishness, I suppose, through a lens of um, being other. Um, but I find it really exciting that it's done with this focus on language. Um, and yeah, it's just different to some of the stuff we've published before, which is London focused, which tends to be around kind of architecture or space. Um, this is much more about what you hear and what is said. Uh, so it's uh, very exciting in that regard. Um, we have copies of the book. If you go through the gallery and out the back, that's where we'll go after people have finished talking. There's drinks out there and stuff like that. So we'll have a sort of shindig after that. Um, if there are any questions at the end, we can either do a kind of put your hand up thing. Um, if there aren't, if people aren't bold enough to do that, we can then just be out there and you can just go up to the authors and ask them in person. I'm sure they won't bite. 
Um, anyway, the format will be that one of us stands here talking whilst the other person is silent uh, and then receives a question from the person next to them uh, and then I'll answer that question and then the next person will stand up and they will then turn the question back to them with a new question and hopefully there'll be a kind of I don't know, sequence of, uh, of things to talk about to do with the book. Um, so Vanny, who, as I said, is, is the kind of mastermind behind the project, um, I'm going to ask you, um, when you conceived of the book, um, what did you imagine an Italian audience would get from reading it? And now it's out in London. What do you sort of see a London audience getting from the book. Do you think they're two different things? Um, and yeah, so as an Italian living in London, I guess you can see how both would be received. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Vanny. Thank you, Kit, and uh, thank you to the Peers Gallery. Uh, more than the man behind the book, I think I'm the book behind the book. The first, this project started with a, a small book I published, written half in English, and half in Italian, then translated into English. This book is called London as a Second Language. And it was an Italian publisher, Humboldt Books, who published this in English, because they are art publishers. They brought this around England and Europe, and uh, they were very happy with that project. And they asked me if this book could be like a trigger for a series of uh, similar texts. And uh, so I suggested a number of writers who live in England, actually live in London, but most of them, everybody except one, are not English. And uh, so I think both the previous book and both the Italian and the English book are all about something which is the in-between. And this is what we are a bit manic about. I run a literary festival and have a, a literary magazine where we publish text in any language and translate into any language. We just launched now a literary prize for people living in England, write, they can write in any language but English. So this in between the languages and in between the cultures and the in between the countries is what we um, are rather fixated about because I believe it's this mix of something which is very familiar and very alien is something that can allow us to understand better the other and ourselves at the same time. So this is a bit the idea behind the Italian and the English version. I think the English version is something special that the Italian, even if we believe in translation very much, cannot fully attain, which is the, uh, the varieties of the English language that you're going to find in this book. Every text in the book is very different as genre, as perspective, as cultural heritage, as literary tradition that is brought in. And uh, each one, each text is written in a very different English because very few writers master English like uh, their mother tongue. All the rest of us, we struggle in different ways, we found different solutions, and this, I think, is something that is a plus, that is, you know, a linguistic embodiment of this in-between. And um, this sort of suspension, this sort of in-between, is what we try to pinpoint this thing with this strange title, Lucifer over London. And uh, when we chose the title, I, we didn't have all the text, we didn't know what the book was going to be about, and also we didn't know how different and diverse these texts are gonna, were going to be. And, uh, and yet, strangely, this title seemed to have, I, uh, I believe now that I have the book in my hands, uh, guessed something that is connecting all of these texts, which is like a sort of hovering obsession which is never fully attainable and yet is always there. And uh, this is, I think, the element that connects this text the most. Uh, for example, Viola Di Grado, who is not here with us, unfortunately, today, she writes about a strange, decrepit angel who comes into the narrating voice house. Uh, Shalou writes about the voice of this kind of prefab English perfection of the archers coming out of radios in cafes. And, uh, um, uh, Joanna writes about cards, playing cards that she found on the street and keep telling her things. And uh, so this sort of obsessive ghost in the shell that is never kind of attainable yet is always trying to allure you to, to, to grasp it is probably what we all felt is part of what London is for us. 
and um, in my case, uh, it's, uh, this presence is a uh, towering presence, is uh, uh, a big estate building that those of you who are local uh, will probably know is Loveless House on this street, which is a beautiful combination of, of names. And uh, this building has a very special staircase, and my main character goes up the staircase following some sort of decalogue of missed encounters. And uh, these are both fostered and frustrated by the architecture itself. So I'm going to read the uh, beginning of uh, The Loveless House. Bertolt Lubetkin was a ferro-concrete engineer and architect. Born in present-day Georgia at the turn of the 20th century, he studied in Moscow and Leningrad, moved to Paris, then to London in 1931. Among the most distinctive features of his architecture are the staircases he places at the structural core of social housing tower blocks. They are there to have an impact on lives, fine and failed example of social condensers, a special idea that has been defined as programmatic layering upon vacant terrain to encourage dynamic coexistence of activities and to generate, through their interference, unprecedented events. Unprecedented events. Lubetkin's penguin pool drums are a social condenser, and so is his Finsbury Health Center. The center's opening arms and entrance were a deliberate attempt to introduce a smile into what is a machine said Lubetkin of his seminal building. Settled down on a vacant terrain amid the grey-brown slums of Finsbury, this strange new bird of brilliant plumage had a body of reinforced concrete and wings consisting of hollow tile floors supported by perimeter beams and structural mullions, partially clad with faience tiles and thermolux glass panels as beautiful as the hair of a beautiful young girl in the summer sunshine. Not far from it, in 1902-03, lived Lenin. In 1942, Lubetkin convinced Finsbury Council to erect a Lenin memorial on that very terrain, made vacant by the intense enemy bombing, and later to build the largest state that was to be named Lenin Court. But unprecedented events occurred, and by the time the building was completed, World War II allies had become Cold War enemies, so that its name was changed from Lenin to Bevin, a post-war anti-communist foreign secretary. As for the memorial, it was repeatedly defaced and contested in Parliament until the day Lubetkin interfered. He rented a crane, removed the movement and buried it at the rear of the state building site, where there is now a car park, some say. Others say that the memorial was buried in a basement of the building, but most say that it is buried at the bottom of its staircase, a radial stair in a circular well. I first noticed and got to know Lubetkin's architecture, and we did a few features of my immediate environment because of one such staircase. So then the presence, the ghost in the shell in my story, floor after floor, will take the form of voices and languages, as Keith said. But as you could hear, architecture and spaces are very present in this story. Uh, now, uh, asking a question to Sale, uh, I will think that in Sale's case, voices and languages are inert. And uh, the haunting presence are images in his case. The text is called The Film Shop. And what is superimposed into, onto reality or inhabits reality are film scenes, films from all the films that he's been renting and watching and watching and renting while the interaction with the city was rather inert. And yet, at the end, after the alienating effect of describing reality like a foreign film with very fast subtitles, comes an hypothesis, an hypothesis that spaces, too, they do remember us, that spaces, too, they might be secretly loving us, and spaces, too, can be waiting for us without us knowing.
Films do not end with the word the end on black screen. After the end, we still think about the film from its last frame and onwards, constructing an epilogue. We go back and forth about what happened and what should or could have happened and what we wished to have happened. In the process, we draw events to our own conclusion that we may change many times over. So perhaps there is no beginning either. An artist friend of mine once told me that her white canvas is never empty before she begins to paint. It is already populated with the mindless projection of images. Some changes are great, some are fine, and some are not. I told myself, standing outside a corner shop after I bought a candle. I looked at the film shop on the other side of the street. I lit the candle and began crossing the street. I struggled with the wind and rain to keep the flame alive. I protected the flame with my hands and my coat. Cars stopped and honked their horn. It took me nine minutes. I put the candle on the pavement in front of the black door of the film shop. The flame died out. The film shop was converted to a grocery store and was called Desmond's, but that too soon closed. I peeped through the horizontal tubes, security shutters. I saw an abandoned ice cream vendor, freezer, and scattered papers on the floor. I looked at the empty shelves all over the walls, then to my left where I used to stand before the desk and chat to Gabrielle, who stood behind it with her tiny but torn figure, her square shaped beautiful face with thick red lips that once shouted, Howers, village of Howers. I then looked straight at the flat, dark wall with no door that would lead you down after a few steps to, to the art house room. I was a member of the film show for almost four years, and for two of those years, I used to go down to this room practically every day, taking home with me three films a day, sometimes four or five if the staff were in a generous mood. I knew this space so well, I told myself, but does it recognize me? Spaces know no mercy. They just spit at your back as soon as you leave them. The relationship is entirely one-sided. Or perhaps they love us silently. Perhaps that's why they keep dragging us to them time and again by putting their spell on us long before we even knew it. So, I, I mean, I wrote this, um, well, kind of, it's a hybrid, you know, kind of a story, an essay. It's about a period of my life, and uh, where well, I used to watch actually three films a day, you know, for a couple of about three years, and then, so it just, um, the film show became part of me, in a sense, and um, there is, is a story is written in, in fragments manner, you know, like fragment, fragment, fragment. And um, we, we don't really know what's the fiction, what's the real. He's basically, in a sense, um, thinking like, you know, the character becomes the films he watches, where in the other sense, he becomes cinema. And, um, and then, you know, it also was written to homage to the film shop and to the cinema, the character he loves. There is one thing I mentioned earlier, it takes the character, he crosses the street, it takes him over, over about nine minutes. And this scene is basically what inspired from Tarkovsky film, where we have a character there, you know, basically the main character is called, actually, you know, the film called Nostalgia. 
So he crosses the film, um, he crosses an empty pool, a swimming pool, and it takes him nine minutes, and the talk, uh, the, the, the shot, is a tracking shot. So he cannot mistake, he cannot make any mistake out of it. And he has to cover this flame. So my last act, I mean, it was just, it, this is my last um, um, uh, fragment in, in the story. So I, I tried to get it to the film shop in a sense where it has to do what actually is, um, I mean, I really don't know, but uh, thank you, I think that's enough. <laughs> anyway, I want to ask you that. Uh, <laughs> I want to ask you, like, um, in your essay, you talk about the imaginary space divider, prime, meridian, in terms of geographical space, or rather, a physical space, that later you develop those terms, interestingly enough, into one's private meridian, or perhaps an inner space. Can you please take us through this inner space? <coughs> It's a big, big philosophical question, and uh, I don't know if you just my, my, the the sequences um, uh, collection chain of um, of a little stories that constitute my um, piece in this wonderful collection, for which I have to thank first of all Chloe for introducing me to Vanny, and then Vanny for introducing us to uh, for Netflix, you know, it's just, um, uh, well, there is this chain of the stories, they're all, um, all about not even geography, but misinterpreted geography. Uh, in Sally's story, by the way, there is a wonderful episode when um, the character, who is half deaf, he mis mishears the words that he is told, is uh, talked to. And I think it was a good met metaphor of, um, of a foreigner in, a, in, a, in, a, in an alien city, because um, usually people who, I don't know, bad at languages, they, they mis mis mishear. Um, the words are misheard. And, uh, so it is just identical to the process when the half-deaf person misinterprets um, the words that are told to him. And this misinterpretation, in a way, could be, uh, the notion of misinterpretation could be extended to, to the whole reality. And um, I uh, decided that I uh, uh, would write about a person who is actually looking for a situation when his orientation is quite firm. What I noticed is that people sometimes, whatever the flat they find themselves, a new flat rented or bought, they set up the furniture absolutely in absolutely identical way. Or they choose the side of the street they got used to. So they've got uh, some kind of inner meridians and parallels by which they are guided through life. And when um, this inner map, inner cartography, uh, 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 is identical to the real cartography of the world, uh, then they feel comfortable. But it eventually you, you realize that it's this uh, sense of comfort is... Um, is a sense of uh, inner identity. And we live in a, in, is actually in a wonderful um, uh, city where you actually could be anyone and the people confuse your identity. And you realize that your inner identity has nothing to do in fact with your origin, uh, sort of the outward cartography of the world, with your ethnic origin uh, with your, the country that you were born into or the country that you lived through uh, a number of years and finally settled down in a different country. What I'm saying is that um, uh, it's like the, the, uh, this inner identity 
inner cartography is uh, something like your accent. Um, my accent, sometimes people find difficult to, to identify it. Some who in the know, they know it is a kind of Russian accent. But in fact, it is all when I talk to the outside, to, to the outside world, to you. Uh, when, I, um, when people talk to themselves, they don't have any accent. This inner voice is absolutely accentless. Um, I don't know, I worked a lot for, uh, still work for radio, and I, I hate when a producer has um, some kind of, I don't know, foreign character, be it Chinese or Uzbekian or Russian, and he suddenly this character has an inner monologue, and suddenly he speaks with the accent that the British actually perceive as that respective um, uh, nationality of, of, of the person. Uh, which is total nonsense, because if it's monologue, he doesn't speak to any British person, he speaks to uh, himself. Uh, himself, he doesn't hear himself. It's a kind of, it's a very strange thing. Like this self-identity, like this inner cartography. So to answer Salia's question, I don't know. I don't know what is inner, inner space, inner uh, space where I feel comfortable. I think the space where I don't feel any cartography. I don't feel any parallels or meridians where I forget about the borders. Uh, and uh, nobody would actually ident uh, would identify me as, as a kind of belonging to a certain tribe. Because the modern notion, modern attitude, as we know, sp specifically during the last few years, is to, to insist that, that ethnic origin of the person is actually dictates all his um, uh, mode of thinking, his uh, philosophy of life, and uh, mode of living, basically, which is total nonsense, of course, as I insist, I would insist. And um, so the stories, I mean, you should read it. I don't want to read anything. Uh, do I have a couple of minutes more? Just I would rather tell you to illustrate what kind of stories are contained in my piece called My Private Prime Meridian uh, by a little anecdote that I didn't include that for the s sake of, I don't know, lim limits of uh, the size of the, of the contribution that it was, I was told about. And the story is, um, is again about definition, who belongs to where. And, uh, and how, and, and it's about a little club that three prominent writers set up. It's been many, it happened many, many years ago, about three decades ago. And um, these three uh, London writers, they set up club, club in Fitzrovia, in a pub upstairs, and uh, I was invited. And I went for about a few months, I was attending it uh, for, for some time, um, I, I, um, I, I was participating in, in a kind of quiet discussion, but I realized that there were about 10 writers present. And I, I found that the writers are very boring people, actually. When they get together, they talk mainly about mortgages and, um, and um, advance payments, et cetera, et cetera, and publishers, because, I don't know, they don't tell stories because they're probably because they're afraid that somebody would steal from them, I don't know. But it's just I found, eventually I found that it's rather boring gatherings and stopped coming. But then after almost a year, I, I, uh, my way, uh, I don't know, I passed through Fitzrovia and I remembered about this uh, gathering and I come up the stairs and suddenly I saw the big room packed really with people, packed. And everyone is talking and flirting and discussing something. And I went to the bar and um, I ordered my whiskey and, um, and the p person next to me said, uh, asked me, um, are you a po polyamory? I said, what? It was about 30 years ago. I wasn't that sophisticated as I am now. Um, are you a polyamory? I said, what, what, does it, what is it supposed to mean? He said, well, you 
do you love many persons, two or three people at the same time, the same passion, love, jealousy? Well, you mean like, I don't know, a novelist, I'm partly a novelist, I mean like, you know, Flaubert said, I don't know, Madame Bovary c'est moi, but at the same time, he loved all other characters, and Tolstoy, Anna Karenina, c'est moi, but there is a, Mr. Karenin, he loved him as much. And he said, are, are, you, are you a novelist? Are you a writer? He said, yes. Ah, I, I said, who are you? He said, I'm a member of Polyamorous Club. I said, what's happening? I mean, it's just now our, our regular place. And it turns out from the certain point, this writer's club started to share space with um, these polyamorous people. And, um, and they started to confuse each other, actually, <laughs> which is a remarkable uh, example of how definition of, of, uh, of a tribe is, doesn't actually define people who are, are coming from this particular tribe. Uh, so I'll uh, ask um, Chloe, um, who... Uh, was born in Mexico, studied in Harvard, and then in Oxford, and finally became a British citizen not that long time ago. And um, a remarkable piece in this collection is, um, is, is about um, different dramatic perception or non-dramatic perception of different countries. Uh, and this juxtaposition of different attitudes towards whether surreal weather reports are set right at the beginning. And gradually, uh, her story, your story, uh, Chloe, um, comes to the point when you describe how you've been um, researching uh, your second novel, Asunder, about a female uh, museum guard, and you've been asking different uh, guards in different museums, and you come up to um, a guard in, in Tate, Britain, and you approached him carefully and asked very carefully, could I interview you? And he said, uh, no, uh, no, I, I, I refuse to be the subject of a writer's imagination. And um, it is amazing. And I thought that the whole piece of description of different countries, you, you have a novel about Berlin, um, is um, somehow what if, um, what if you approach the country and if the country feels that in a similar way that it refuses to be the subject of a writer's imagination. Because we are talking about how a wonderful attitude, uh, how wonderful we all feel and interestingly, uh, what kind of interesting life we, lives we have in, in London. But London is very tolerant, at the same time very evasive. Um, it is very difficult to, to actually to catch uh, some aspect of it who would create a narrative. And uh, you, you also say in the same piece that when you describe uh, a country, there is another country, the previous country is in the shadow, sort of uh, trying to upstage your perception of, of the country you are in. So to what extent do you think um, to what extent do you think it's um, difficult actually to write about England? Because, by the way, Lucifer over London, a Lucifer is a, is a cigarette lighter, as you know, which is just in a war time. So it's just, it's again, it's the different perception of the, of the word by foreigners and locals. It's not um, my linguistic uh, discovery, I just I was told when the people read this, the title of the book. 
So I hope you got my complicated question. <laughs> <laughs> You've answered so much of it already, I think, but I'll try to add to it. Um, so Zinovi, thank you for this. Wonderful. Um, I guess as anyone who has spent time in Berlin, it, it's a city that sort of hands, that, well, any imagination it sort of hands you a silver platter full of um, images and tensions and, oh my, and, um, <laughs> that's better, yeah. Um, so yeah, so Berlin, I'd spent two summers there in the mid 80s and they cast such a spell that I knew I'd always be returning. So when I finished my graduate studies, I moved there to write my first book. And um, well, for many reasons, it was the, the ideal place to write, especially um, one's first n novel, because uh, well, Zinovi, it's, a country, it's a city that has so many tensions and it's such a mysterious city, less so now because there's been so much whitewashing of the East. And um, when I lived there in the mid 90s and then in the early 2000s, it still f had still preserved a lot of. Um, it was still very. There was still this dualism that one feels is, um, is vanishing. But um, and then also, of course, just living in a language. Even though I I, I speak German, but it created um, one or two degrees of remove. So somehow you inhabit your other tongue more deeply. And um, it was Zinovi was saying earlier about mishearing. I would often mishear things and. Um, the only example I can think of now, but I put it in my book, was Wahnsinn and Wahnsinn, and you know, madness and then Wahnsinn. But, and that sort of mishearing that immediately gives you an idea for a whole riff or paragraph in your book. And, um, but coming back to England, um, I, d I, did, I was scared that when I left Berlin after nearly six years and moved to England, that I would lose something that I would have to search much more for mystery and strangeness in day-to-day -day life and in the faces of people and that um, every time I stepped out of the house there wouldn't be the same potential for mishearing and misunderstanding and um, sort of narrative digression, immediate narrative, narrative digressions in your head. But I also welcomed the challenge and um, so when I for the second, my second novel uh, set in London, but I decided very much on setting it one of my favorite places here, which was the National Gallery, which w became sort of a microcosm for me of London. And, um, and again, just sort of finding the um, sites of tension within that space and, um, and trauma. So I thought of the suffragettes. And so, in, of course, in any city, there's... Um, sites of trauma and tension and not as visible as in, in Berlin, not as palpable, the tension. Now it has a different set of tensions from when I lived there after. It was still dealing with the end of the Cold War when I lived there, but now of course it's, uh, migration is probably the, the main issue uh, politically. But um, maybe I'll read now because I'm not as good at riffing as Zinovi. <laughs> but, um, so I'll read about well, the opening he mentioned <clears throat> Which, yeah, I thought about um, <clears throat> when you've when you're well read when you've read a lot of different literatures from different countries, mo uh, you know, a lot of it in translation. But um, inevitably, each country sort of creates its own mental weather in your head. <clears throat> so, I thought of sort of an imaginary weather report on a few countries. So, uh, Germany. <clears throat> so the piece, my piece is called Notes on the Weather. Uh, Germany. A geometric front, front stretching east and north from large quadrilaterals centered over Berlin will bring the threat of extreme angularity. Damaging fractals, torrential axioms, and even isolated zeros will be possible for Cologne down into Bavaria. France, vigorous symbolism will continue to bring threat of shipwreck and heavy mermaid showers in several locations. Hungary, a Sumerian front stretching east and north and giant owls hovering over Budapest will bring a rash of ancestral thunder, intermittent candlelight, unidentified accents, and even isolated bluebeards will be possible from Vach down to Hodomosova <laughs> Sarrerli. Mexico. High pressure from underground will create significant crackler throughout the country. Increased moisture in the south will lead to expansion and contraction depending on temperature. Spiral cracks in the north due to extreme tension on surface. Corn ear cracks in the southeast due to sliding pressure. 
Meanwhile, a white powdery front moves in from the southeast towards the north border. This is the cocaine I've seen. <laughs> Russia. A suprematist front will be stretching from northwest to southeast with heavy abstraction bringing possibility of aesthetic purity. Black spells, chromatic silences, and occasional rain of wolves will be experienced from St. Petersburg to Vladivostok. And then there is England, my home. Because I live here, the weather feels more prosaic, as, it does, as do its weather reports. One searches for allegory, but it hides behind a cloud. Its signs not readily open to prediction or interpretation, a constant game of chance between the sky and the umbrella. My report, therefore, remains abstract. England, a strong low poetic system will lead to metaphor and potentially damaging similes across England today. The strongest metaphors will occur on the southwest side, where they could gust past their reference at 60 kilometers per hour. Allegory totals upwards of two centimeters can be expected. Yet once long ago, the country, or rather my idea of it, represented something more tangible and concrete. And then I just go on, my essay is basically about how, I think about <clears throat> the hold London has over my imagination. It's very different from Berlin. And I realize I go back to the London of the 80s where I visited many summers with my family and the music I listened to and the Goths in Camden and the much more bohemian um, atmosphere it seemed to have at the time, um, <clears throat> much less corporate. But it, one still finds it like here, but one just has to search a bit more. <laughs> And now, Shaolu, I'll ask you two questions. Yeah. Um, so the first one is, um, <clears throat> your piece in the book describes your relationship to England via your exposure to the English language and some of the hidden ideology within it, and the archers, the life in the UK exam, the oath to the queen. But son since you're such a highly visual person too, a filmmaker and a photographer, I guess um, I'd be interested to know um, your early acquaintance with England, how uh, how it was mapped out visually, if certain objects or things uh, stood out for you or um, sort of early coordinates established themselves visually. Mm. Thank you. Because I'm not going to read, that's why uh, Chloe is doing Q&A with me. So I'm going to mumble a bit like they know me going to do, but a bit more stand-up comedian like. Um, but <laughs> thank you. Um, before I answer your question, I, I think this is very nice. I, I Now I remember how I met everyone here, the, all the writers in this book. And I remember we lived in the same street in Berlin before we moved back, right? You lived around the Wasserton in East Berlin. And then we met here in London. And I met Vani many years ago when, we, when I lived in Zurich. And you came to Zurich to say, can you come to my festival on the other side? Swiss Italian side, not in the Swiss German side. And I remember we said, okay, fine. And then we met back in London again and we collaborated on these books. And, um, and also Simone as well. I remember, you know, all these, we are so sort of foreigners. And I remember one day a Chilean Latino filmmaker wrote to me, can I introduce you, <laughs> Simone, an actress from Brazil, can she come to London? And uh, just all these people, you know, from all over the place, and then eventually met here. And Zinovia as well. I think when we met, we talked about Russia, China, passionately and angry and uh, crazy. And now we're all here. So, um, but sadly, we, we met later on, right, from, from Vani. Um, so that's really a um, strange memory because we all said, are we, we going to stay here <laughs> after Brexit? And we're all still here every day. Uh, <laughs> so answer your question. So visual. Um, strangely... Uh, England and London is, was and is still the last place I can visualize because it's so much like a maze, the whole structure of the streets and the housing estates and there's a little Victoria house and the Georgian house. Um, I found it very difficult to visualize London in a cinematic way. And even though I did make a film called uh, Late at Night, um, Voices of Ordinary Madness, and you can imagine the late night, the madness, the whole... I think it's ungraspable that the city and this country, because the multitudes of the, the lives and, the, and the narratives and the political voices, and especially the last few years, the, the divide, divide, divided voices, um, I almost thought I you know, might be able to visualize US, maybe, maybe in, a, in a cinematic way, maybe even a bit easier, dare I say. Um, I always found it very difficult to, to, to make a film in England. And as you, Chloe, you made a film here 
very cool, strange films. <laughs> and I think we end up doing things in the sort of in these labyrinths and politically as well. In in such a moment, I think you know it does affect our writing and our, our filmmaking. And especially, I think as a filmmaker as well, I know I didn't make any film um, last four years now. I think since Brexit, with funding resource. And thanks, Garris in the back. You know, he was always supporting me. And the next time, you got to <laughs> support again. So this, I so I returned to writing really just the last few years. Just uh, didn't make film, and I was very intensely writing and revising, and I've sort of tried to pin down a book based on you know this Britain in the in the European environment, even though we are out, but but we are here. And I guess my la my next question, which <clears throat> I think I know you've written about it, but um, <clears throat> one's always curious to still ask you again, is how much translation still goes on in your head and how much do you think in English, Chinese? Yeah, good question, because like you, you you grew up in in Holland or, or yeah, in, in New York, so yeah, Mexico, and that. then, yeah, so all these language, and now you write in English. Um, I think... I think you know. Always, I always say we are from far away. We're from different alphabet. We, we are not from alphabet as Chinese. We're from pictograms. We're from ideograms. We're from imagerism. So when you write a word, is an image, and um, and therefore the Chinese writers, we wrote small, concise books, and in the translation will be three times more or much bigger because the translation going through the alphabetical. Um, process to reimagine the image in the Chinese language. And I think for me, you know, I don't know how you process the linguistic difference from Spanish to English. And indeed, you know, what kind of language you, in your thought or the thought language, uh, which is that maybe nothing to do with our verbal language. But I think in my case was this very layered confusion and self-translation going on through my writing because I was in China for 30 years. I've been living in China for 30 years. So when I came over, already not a young writer. So I guess the transition is, is almost like middle-aged writers start to write in another Euro a European language, which has nothing to do with pictograms. And I think the translation is, is a deep one, is a self-translating. You know, what, what do we do when we write metaphors? Um, the Chinese metaphor is purely picture-based or folk-based. How do I translate that images in Western language? And I think that deeply it's more like I'm constantly building this bridge for myself to cross in order for the reader to cross. Could you give us an example of how would you translate a metaphor? So, for example, if we say two people love each other, um, in the in the pre Mao time, the idiom is this: uh, we love each other just like water, yu shui xiang rong, so fish and water being together. So, but you don't say the first part: we love each other. You only say yu shui xiang rong, so fish and water together, to indicate something to do with that word. That word should never be pronounced. But in the post Mao time, we use that word idiom yu shui xiang rong, meaning Soldiers and the peasants love each other just like fish and water. So dream means so armies and the peasants, right? But how do we translate that? So if I write a, a, a story you know, about that lover's relationship, then I need to be very careful because I think the connotation will be the communist one or the feudal one. So, and indeed, I cannot use that metaphor anymore. So then I pick up an English metaphor, which is, you know, is it from Victoria time or is it from modern days East End uh, metaphor? You know, something equivalent. But I think it, the, the journey of the writing sentence is encountering all these kind of very practical, but also deeply cultured, embedded, coded translation. And in a way, it's unbearable process because you lose freedom, you lose flow. And I never encounter any second of flow in my English writing life. You know, and I think I do miss that. And I think do miss that deeply, even you know, when I read an uh, English language book, is I never had a flow. And it's, it's almost like reading has been no longer a pleasure in my life. You know, since I moved over here, 
19, 19 years ago, it, reading has been a torture and a suffering. And this kind of translation process, you know, each sentence I stop, I go to check the metaphor, all the, the what, what, what it means really in the, in the background or from the history. Something like that? Is it good? Yeah. Okay. Very good. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I think it's my turn, thank you, Chloe, to introduce our next writer, uh, Susanna, who is uh, from Portugal, but she's not here in this yeah, plagued country, she can't come, wise of her. But instead, I will introduce a beautiful uh, uh, Portuguese language actress, uh, Simone, to read uh, Susanna's text. And uh, please, yeah, go ahead. To do to learn invisibility, to strive for it, to blossom in it, because uh, no one is looking. To learn to spend days nameless, to learn anonymity to the point you know exactly why you no longer wish to remain anonymous, unknown, unaccounted for. To learn to talk about the weather. Because if we might know the words for so many things, they might correspond to different images, to different people, and the weather is there. A sky above, gray, wet, cloudy, clear, blue, bright, to learn to speak by increments, each time revealing a bit more, to learn to make a fool of yourself. Since you have come this far anyway, to learn to be disdained for your foolishness or admired for it, since it can so often mean that you are daring. To learn to play it all, win it all, lose it all. To learn to expect the opportunity to play it all. To win it all. Lose it all. To learn to be patient. To learn to, to wait for your turn. Because so many people are waiting for their turn at a bus stop at a line in the post office, at a job, at an opportunity, at a break, at a dream, at happiness. Why should you go first? To learn kindness in the face of distress. To learn how to show that kindness through small gestures, to learn to say things with the eyes, to comfort strangers you are not advised to talk to, to learn to use politeness as a useful tool. To learn to keep it real in a scenery that's too often part of fictional narratives or historical narratives so far-fetched that they might as well be fictional. To learn to resist the temptation of following the parallel story, the unlived story, the what-ifs of life. To learn 
to love a neighborhood or just a street or even just a bit of a street like people love a small town or a village. To learn to love protectively, defensively, and always fiercely, as if your honor depend on it. To learn to love old fashionably, to say, I will commit to love this neighborhood, this Oxton Street, or even this tiny bit of Oxton Street, for as long as I may live here, no matter how little time in this fast moving world. <laughs> uh, well, that was fabulous. Um, all five, six. Uh, and thank you to Vanny. Thank you to Chloe. Thank you to Jalu. Thank you to Zinovi. Thank you to Sana. Thank you to Pierre as well. Um, and thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming. And just quickly say, if you follow the building around the back, there's a bar with drinks. Both books are available for sale. The exhibition half at the library is open until 8 if you want to go and see it. And we'll be open here for slightly longer. Thank you.